A lot of people don't understand what's going on at the moment. They see people getting sick around them. People are struggling with symptoms. And this is different from excess deaths where lots of people were, were dying or still are dying. Because if you have excess deaths, almost invariably you have excess sickness. And so we are likely to be seeing an excess morbidity, illness, crisis across the world in specific regions. And I'm going to be explaining a little bit about the simple concepts as to why I think that this is being driven by the actions in the pandemic that are predisposing work age population people to getting sick. Before I start, just a reminder that coming up shortly is our conference on NeuroCOVID, the neurological aftermath of COVID-19. And this is also very relevant with what we're seeing at the moment. A lot of people are just sick. What's going on? Why are they getting sick? So what is it that really um, triggered this conversation? It was some data. I'm going to show you where I got it from, but I'll show you the inconvenient question that I was asking in relation to the data. And it was this, is COVID vaccination status relevant in attempting to understand this trend? And what this is looking at is thousands of persons, and you can see down here, 27,000, and this is from 2009 all the way up to 2025. And what you can see here is that it was around stable 2016, the 2020 came down a bit early in the pandemic because people either lockdowns and so on. And then suddenly you start to have this rise. And part of this rise would be what I call pure long COVID, meaning people who had COVID infection and ended up with long term chronic illness. It's not just related to the elephant. But then you see this ongoing trend. And it is now at the highest level that it has been for population with a disability 16 years and over. And so my question was simple. This rising trend that we have, is this just simply COVID infection or is it infection in the context of vaccination? There are two very it's a subtle difference, and a lot of people don't quite get it. They, they think that when I ask this question, I'm being anti-vax. You know, you're, you're looking for problems with the vax. No, well, how do I explain this? I've always said the spike protein is an issue. If you then broadly use it, it is no surprise to me that you would find population level issues. And so this is part of the point is that I am looking at it because the science indicates that this is likely to be what is happening. And so this is the bit that they are not quite grasping. Um, and you can see here, uh, let me just see if I can show you this here. So this is taken from, let me just go back to the not full screen so yeah, you understand what it is. So this is taken from the United States Federal Reserve Branch of St. Louis, Fred, population with a disability, 16 years and over. This is from July of 2025, and it was the last updated on August 1st, 2025. And as I said, this is looking now from about 2015 when it was stable, this was the period of the pandemic, or it's in gray here because this is a recession when they shut down the economy. Then it drops down to the low point here. This is in July of 2020, just after lockdowns. And then you see this consistent rise all the way up to the highest that it has been. This is unlikely to be, again, closer look. This is unlikely to just be something about the infection alone. And this is the point that I'm making. So people think that I'm discounting infection. No, no, no. I know infection with the spike protein is likely to drive chronic disease. It's what drove severe COVID-19. So of course, I know infection is a big part of it. 
But the question I was just asking is a very simple question. Look at the slide again. If we were from, say, about June 2022, and we look at the people, and at that point it's 33,223, it's up to 35,889. So that's over 2,000 new people with disabilities. So my question is very simple. If you look at this cohort of the extra 2,000 people, is it relevant to check their vaccination status? Because suppose you found that 95% of this cohort here was vaccinated. Is it irrelevant? Now, what's happening is that people who are stuck in a narrative don't even want to look at that. They just say immediately, if you're asking that question, that is anti-vax. No, there's a reason I'm asking the question. And the reason I'm asking the question is because of the premise of what I call the COVID storm. It, it's what I've been talking about for now almost a year. I started in June of 2020 for talking about this principle of the COVID storm. This is what it looks like. If you have two tubes of glue, and this is the epoxy principle, where one tube on its own doesn't really, is not very sticky, the other tube on its own isn't, but when you combine them together, you have a very powerful adhesive. And what I'm saying is that if you have a population that is immune primed with the vaccine and are having recurring infection, is this, in theory, a risk factor for severe problems? That's essentially all I'm asking when I'm looking at this. And so I am considering that what we are seeing with the numbers is, in effect, the fact that a population that has been immune primed is getting reinfected. So it is still infection, but it's infection in a population who has specific immunological risks. And what are they? So this is the bit that a lot of people don't want to acknowledge. And this is why there doesn't want to be acknowledgement about it. Just in case you wondered why is it that this is that's a pretty straightforward question to, to answer. There's a reason why this doesn't want to be acknowledged. Um, I will just show you here. This is uh, the upper airway, and I usually use this, the principle of upper airway mucosal protection or immunity. And the virus can infect the upper airway, and if there is good mucosal immunity, the virus can't break through to then cause an immune response in the bloodstream. OK, it doesn't mean it doesn't cause infection here. And actually, it doesn't mean it can't cause longer term issues because some people, based on the research, have a highly inflamed epipharyngeal region, which is driving a lot of symptoms. That's a whole different conversation. And so in theory, even a mild infection can cause long term symptoms. However, once they have been infected, it's very difficult for the virus to break through this very important layer because it's very sophisticated. It's, it's, not, it's not a simple, just a layer. It is a very sophisticated immune system. It's like your skin inside the upper airway. And so the principle, in my view, is that the unvaccinated who survived COVID, so meaning that if you're unvaccinated and you had comorbidities, you're at higher risk for severe COVID. The low risk cohort, therefore, however, would it get getting exposed, they could have had an infection. But once they had an infection, the immune system in the upper airway is then very well primed for all the variants. The problem that we see in the vaccinated cohort is that there is a very strong spike response to the original variant, which is the Wuhan variant. And this is likely to have an impact with the antibodies that are produced. Additionally, the injection doesn't train the mucosal immunity. So that's not what it's there for. It's to train systemic immunity. 
So the mucosal immunity is not strengthened by vaccination. And so therefore what happens is that you then have a skewed immune response to the spike protein. And my suspicion, based on the observation and the data, is that those vaccinated cohorts are struggling to control infection in the mucosa. And so therefore they have a higher risk of it breaking through into the bloodstream. Additionally, those who are boosted have IgG4, which means they're more tolerant of infection. And so what I think we're seeing when we look at the data related to the, um, the, mortal the morbidity here, what we're seeing is that the reinfections are primarily occurring in the vaccinated cohort. They're not getting severe disease and everybody's taking that, that's great. It is, but in the low risk cohort, they had low risk of severe disease anyway. But if they're getting infection after infection, the spike protein triggers many pretty serious immune responses and that can then lead to people being sick. And the sad part is very often they can't even connect the two things. They don't know. This is now a responsibility within public health to try and figure this out. Because the other question is not just whether or not they had been vaccinated, but what number of vaccines did they have? Did they have one, two, three, four, five? I suspect and this is again based on previous research that came out, I suspect that one of the most significantly affected cohorts who have had a vaccine are those who had a single vaccine, one vaccine. And it usually indicates that when they had one vaccine, they had some kind of side effect that prevented them from or made them not want to take a second one. And therefore their immune system is very much primed to have abnormal, unusual responses. These are the kinds of things that need to be understood. But if we have a situation where there is fear of looking at the data, looking at the science, acknowledging the fact that there may be longer term immune response damage, that is what is holding everything back. And sadly, what I will say is this. The reason that people would not investigate this is because they are concerned about their own position. It may be that they were part of mandates, they pushed it, and they are concerned about their personal situation. But here is the truth. If they are aware of this and they choose not to investigate it, what they are then doing is passing the accountability to the population. And that accountability may be reflected five to 10 years down the line when the damage has already been done. If that's the kind of leadership you have in your country, wherever you are in the world, where they are seeing similar patterns. This is just one bit of data, but I can guarantee you it is likely to be happening across the highly vaccinated regions in the world because of what I explained about mucosal immunity. And they are choosing to ignore that because of potential upset and fallout because you know it may mean that they said the right, wrong thing at the time. Those are not healthcare leaders that you want because what it means is that they are more willing to protect a narrative, to protect the political implications, to protect the financial implications. They are not acting in your health, population health's best interest. That's just the truth. And what can you do if you don't call it out? As I say to patients with hypertension, your blood pressure is not your doctor's responsibility. Your doctor doesn't come into hospital if you get a stroke. You better know what your numbers are. In the same way, if these things are happening and they are occurring around you with people that you know and you love and you choose 
to leave it alone and not force your health authorities to answer these questions, believe me, the accountability will still fall in your hands. It will be your problem down the line, not theirs. We need to ask the hard questions, even though they may be inconvenient, because nobody else will. Have a good evening.